Okay, welcome back to Jeffrey. We've missed you, Jeffrey. I've had to do all the work all on my own. Oh, I'm so sorry. It just it coincides with shul uh, when I'm in England. Yeah, I know it's uh, it's not easy in England because uh, it's right in in Shachris time. I know. Yeah. Um, right, we are um, in Gemara Sanhedrin. We are making rapid progress. Um, relatively speaking. Um, we're on Yud Zayin Ahmed Aleph, page 89 uh, in the um, Steinsalz Gemara, which I shall put up on the screen straight away. Uh, there we go. Hopefully you should see that in a second. There we go. So where are we holding? So we're at this little s sign here which tells us that we are um, at a new subject we finished last week the subject of whether there were 70 or 71 members of the great sanhedrin we of course have known all along that it was 71 but the reason we knew that all along is because we cheated and we learned to in the mishnah right at the beginning so, which was important because all the way through we've talked about um, the need for 71 member Sanhedrin for various things like expanding Jerusalem and like going out to war. That's what we've been talking about for the last few months. All the things that we've needed a 71 man based in for. So the last couple of weeks, the Gemara sort of woken up and said, well, hang on a minute. Is it really 71 members? There was an opinion, if I'm not mistaken, it was Rabbi Yehuda. Um, who said it was 70 members. There were only 70 members. And of course, we learned it out. So the Gemara then said, all right, well, where's the proof? Where's the scriptural proof that we know that there were 71 or even 70 members for the Sanhedrin? And of course, we learned it from the appointment of the 70 elders. Remember, uh, we did this last week. We talked about this story. I'm going to look, show it you again in a minute. But we talked about the story of Ivrat um, Hata'ava, the burial place of desire. That was what the place was called. And what happened was, you will recall, is the people, for a change, decided to complain. And they said, I'm sick of this man stuff. We want some meat. Give me flesh. And Moshe said, where are we going to get meat from for 600,000 people? Uh, I can't do it anymore. I've had enough of this lot. Um, and the Kodesh Baruch Hu said, OK, I'll give you some help. Go and find 70 elders um, and they will share the burden with you. They will share the burden of prophecy with you. And so we had a discussion in the Gemara as to whether... Moshe was uh, aside from the Sanhedrin, aside from the 70 elders, or whether he was in addition to the 70 elders. Rabbi Yehuda's opinion was that he was separate from the 70 elders, and therefore the Sanhedrin was 70 people. The Chachamim said that Moshe was part of the 70 elders, or in addition to the 70 elders, he presided over them, if you like. He was the president of the uh, 70 elders, and therefore, in total, the Sanhedrin was 71 members. That's what we did last week. Uh, and of course... How did, uh, help with the, how did that help with getting the meat? I thought it would have said 70, 70 cows. <laughs> well, what they sent was a billion quail, wasn't it? Uh, if you remember. Um, so how did it help? The elders well, how did it, the elders help? it didn't really help it's a good question. They didn't really help on that particular um, on that particular aspect. Um, it was for the future going forward that Moshe would have a group of people around him, a group of elders with whom he could consult, with whom he could share the burden. You know what they say: um, a uh, a trouble shared is a trouble halved. Um, and Moshe had said, I can't do this all on my own. And Moshe and Hashem said, OK, I'll give you help. But you're right. It was not. It didn't actually solve any. And funnily enough, it's a good question that you asked, Johnny. And we're going to learn it. We may not get to it today. Uh, we may, may 
may not reach it today. We may have to wait till next week. But there is uh, a, a, su a suggestion that these 70 elders actually didn't do very much ever. And that they were all, you know, they were just a bit, bit sort of uh, of a window dressing, if you like. So you're right to ask that question. They didn't actually do anything. Um, so uh, that's what we learned last week. And then I asked you a question right at the end of last week. I said, did you ever think about this? Because I didn't. How did Moshe choose the 70 elders? Let's go and look at the psukim straight away and see uh, what we're talking about. Can you see the psukim on the screen or do I have to read? No, re no we can see it. You can see it. Good. OK, so. This is in Parashat Bahalotcha, and, and this is uh, we'll, we'll start at the beginning. We'll give Jeffrey a bit of work to do. Um, he says the people say. Um, this people cried out to Moses from verse four, Jeffrey. But the multitude among them began to have strong cravings. Then even the children of Israel once again began to cry, and they said, Who will feed us meat? We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt free of charge, the cucumbers, the watermelons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our bodies are dried out, for there's nothing at all. We have nothing but manna to look at. <laughs> now the manna was like coriander seed, and its appearance was like the appearance of crystal. Just stop there for a second, Jeff. If I were to ask you, all of you, um, what did the man taste of? What would you say, Johnny? I thought it was to taste whatever they wanted it to yes, taste. Yes, of course, that's what you would yeah. say. Avril's nodding. Michael, you've heard that stuff as well, and Jeffrey. Of course, we've all heard that that midrash. Is it true? No, of course not. What it says, what it says in the in the Torah, clearly what it was. The manna was like carry on coriander seed, and its appearance was like the appearance of crystal. It was like go on verse eight, Jeffrey. The people walked about and gathered it. Then they ground it in a mill or crushed it in a mortar cooked it in a pot and made it into cakes. It had a taste like the taste of oil cake. Stop there. So now I'll ask you the question again. What did the man taste of? Okay. No, oil cake. Oil cake. The Torah tells us what it tasted of. So why are we taught as children in kindergarten and at the ripe old age of, who's the oldest here? I think you are, Johnny. The, the yes. old, ripe, ripe old age of 80. Are you 80? Yes. Yes, good. Yes, yeah. Ad, Admea Vesrim. At the yeah. ripe old age of 80, Johnny still thinks that the man tasted of anything you wanted to taste. Now, you know my hobby horse about kindergarten Judaism. This is a perfect example. It's wonderful in the kindergarten to say uh, uh, this midrash to explain to children that this man that Akadosh Baruch Hu gave us was wonderful. It was so wonderful, it could taste a bubblegum ice cream, if that's what you wanted it to taste of. It could taste of steak and chips or, or, you know, hummus with harif. Whatever you wanted, it could taste of. Wow, says the children. What a miracle. That's amazing. Isn't Akadosh Baruch Hu kind? It can taste of chocolate chip cookies. Uh, and I'll have chocolate chip cookies every day of my life. I'll just be able to close my eyes and I'm eating chocolate chip cookies. I think Rabbi Bolkin tells us that medrash as well. <laughs> yeah, it's a medrash. It's fine, no problem with a medrash. But when you package a medrash as truth, what are you going to say when you're a little bit older and you act maybe a lot older when you get to 80 and somebody bursts your bubble and says, no, it didn't. The Torah tells you very clearly what it tasted of. It tasted of oil cake. Now, I ask you, uh, where's the sense in that? Because all you're uh, an intelligent and uh, um, um, mature person um, who uh, can handle all of that. But what if you were a 18 year old yeshiva bocha and you told this midrash and you told, no, it could taste of whatever you wanted. And then you go and you read the, the Chumash itself and you say to your Rebbe, 
But that midrash goes against what the Torah says. Torah says it tasted of oil cake. Ah, but it was a miracle. So why doesn't the Torah say that? Why does the Torah say something that's not true? If the Torah said something that's not true, maybe all of it's not true. And it's a very, very dangerous scenario that you go through. The fact that it doesn't happen all that often is really a testament to the fact that the most yeshiva bochrim and most people learning throughout their lives don't give it a second thought, which is sad. But it's, it's a travesty. It shouldn't happen. When, it's a, when you're told things in kindergarten, that's one thing. You should be told later on as you mature, when you become 14, 15, 18, whenever it is, you should be told this is a midrash. It's not to be taken literally. It's there to enhance the picture of the miracle of the man. It's not to be taken literally. Um, and um, it can't be taken literally because there is a pasuk in the Torah which tells us what it tasted of. Okay, that's my hobby horse done for this morning. You've heard it all before, but this is such a perfect example of it um, that I, I, I couldn't let the opportunity go by. So, uh, Jeffrey, we now um, know that uh, these people are moaning because they want meat and they've remembered, uh, and this is another interesting psychological uh, ploy that the mind plays on us, isn't it? Uh, what do they remember in Egypt? Do they remember that they were beaten half to death and that they had to uh, build from morning till night? No, what they remember is the beautiful cucumbers and the watermelons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic which they probably didn't get at all. Uh, but um, that's what they recall, because the psychology is, I don't like this oil cake anymore. I'm sick of having oil cake every single day. Uh, and I'm uh, uh, and I'm lusting after meat. So... Uh, How long do they have, they have them on for? How long did it take them to complain? Um, well, that's a good question. When did this happen? Um, how long have they been having the man for when this happened? Let me just get my bearings in the, the, the story here. Um, this is before or after the uh, before or after the spies. It's before the spies, isn't it? It's before the spies, and so therefore it's within the first um, two years. So early on, early on. How do we know that? Because the episode of the spies is when they were decreed to, to stay for 40 years in the desert. They were on their way in. Uh, to the, if it hadn't been for the spies, they'd have gone straight in. So yeah. if this is before the spies, which it is because Baalotcha comes before um, Shlach Lecha, um, so it must have been before the spies, must have been in the first year after uh, after the Yitziat Mitzrayim. So they've not had it for all that long. Okay. Well, Shabbos, and Shabbos, they got two lots of oil cake. They got two lots of oil cake, yeah. <laughs> okay, but yeah, but those ones tasted of chopped liver. <laughs> right, okay. Oh, but only if you were Ashkenazi. If you were Sfadi, they tasted of, of something else. Um, right, okay, so where are we up to? Uh, verse, uh, verse, 10, Jeffrey. Moses heard the people weeping with their families, each one at the entrance to his tent. The Lord became very angry, and Moses considered it evil. Moses said to the Lord, why have you treated your servants so badly? Why have I not found favour in your eyes that you place the burden of this entire people upon me? Did I conceive this entire people? Did I give birth to them? that you say to me, carry them in your bosom as the nurse carries the suckling to the land you promised their forefathers. Where can I get meat to give all these people? For they are crying on me, saying, give us meat to eat. Alone, I cannot carry this entire people, for it is too hard for me. Just stop there. Just as a, uh, as a, uh, just as an aside, what a powerful speech by Moshe Rabbeinu, who, and it's very interesting. He didn't say that at the Egel HaZahav. He didn't say that even at the spies, although he did say, you know, get rid of the spies in, an, in, a, in a miraculous way. 
what was it about this particular complaint that made Moshe throw his hands up in despair and say, I can't do this anymore? He never said that anywhere else. Did he say, um, I can't take these people anymore? I can't do it. Cut me out of the story. I'm not interested. He did say to God, if you don't forgive the people, uh, you can cut me out of your book. But here he's saying to God, I've had it with these people. What was it about this particular complaint that uh, got his goat, as it were? Any any ideas, any suggestions? Maybe he understood because he also didn't like the old cake. So he really understood what they're complaining about. I think it's the opposite. If he understood what he, they were complaining about, he would have said, you know what, they're right, these people. Why haven't you given them meat? I'm on their side. And he's, he's not. He's saying, I can't take this anymore. I'm fed up with all this complaint. Get me out of here. Well, I think he realises the people were ungrateful. And whatever he, he served them, or whatever he did, it wasn't good enough for them. Right. Right. There's something specific, isn't there, about this complaint that Moshe sees as unreasonable. So, for example, they they go um, after the Matan Torah, um, they go three days and they can't find water. And so they complain. And Moshe does not say anything bad about them because that's a perfectly reasonable complaint. You're going a big, a, a, a big group of people and you've got no water and you're the leader. That's very difficult. And that's a perfectly reasonable complaint. They need water. Um, the spies, even, it wasn't, uh, uh, it, was, it was wrong what they did. They came back and they said that we're, you know, we're not strong enough to do it. But it was at least logical. What Moshe is saying here is, this is a people who can never be satisfied. Akalish Baruch has provided them with this miraculous food in the desert. They don't have to plant, they don't have to sow, they don't have to reap, they don't have to grind, they don't have to do anything. It's there, as it were, on a plate for them. And it's not good enough. And by the way, that is why this Midrash comes along. Because the Midrash comes along to strengthen Moshe's complaint. Imagine if it was true, that Midrash, right? Moshe would say to them, you ungrateful bunch, why do you need meat? Shut your eyes and it'll taste of meat. That's another proof, by the way, that we know it didn't happen. Because if they wanted meat and it could taste of whatever you wanted to, close your eyes and it tastes of steak and chips, right? Uh, um, so obviously it's not the case. So the Midrash came along in order to bolster the, uh, Moshe's complaints and to justify Moshe's complaint against the people even more by saying, you know what, this miraculous food was so miraculous, it could taste of whatever it what you wanted it, and you're still not happy. You're still not satisfied. You're a bunch of ingrates. I've had it with you. I can't do it anymore. Yes, Jeff? Um, surely this goes to prove that when you give someone for something for nothing, they don't appreciate it. They are craving for something. He gives them something to stop the craving, but they're ungrateful because it was for free. They didn't have to do anything for it. They didn't have to work. They didn't have to do anything. They were like on benefits. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Jeffrey. Um, uh, so anything that is free at the point of delivery uh, has little or no value. Um, by the way, um, you were quoted in, um, and I can't remember uh, why I said it, but you were quoted in uh, one of the shiurim that you weren't there the other day, because I quoted um, Grand, one of Grand's expressions. We were talking in, in, in a similar vein. We were, talking, we were talking in a similar vein about, uh, um, oh, it was in the tefillah shir, that's right. We were talking about uh, getting a gift for nothing. Exactly what you're talking about. And I quoted Grand's saying, can you, remember, can you think about what saying I might have quoted when, uh, uh, when, when talking about getting something for nothing that somebody else has had to pay for? <laughs> Paths working, uncles rich. Absolutely. Paths working, uncles rich. 
Um, I'll try and find it on the recording for you and, I, and I'll send it to you. Because I said, it's a shame Jeffrey's not here. He'll love this one. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Anything that's free at the point of delivery is not worth anything. Let me tell you a little story about that, a true story. Um, um, as some of you will know, um, my uh, father and Jeffrey's mother were in business together and they had a clothes shop. And one of the things you do when you sell clothes and, and somebody buys a dress, Avril will know this, when you go and buy a dress, they say to you, do you want the hanger? And most people say, no, they don't want the hanger. So they take it off the hanger and they put the, the dress in the bag and they make the sale. What happens to that hanger, do you think? Well, I'll tell you what happens to it in Lieberman's. It gets put in a box and it gets taken upstairs to the, the, the storeroom. And eventually you can't move the hangers, right? It's a big balagan. It's a big mess. And along comes little Johnny who's at this stage a teenager and just starting to uh, uh, just starting to, you know, have a little bit of thought process going on. And I said, why don't you bag them up, put them in black bin bags and put them outside the shop and say, free hangers, help yourself. Right. That means we get rid of the hangers. We can clear the space upstairs and um, and, you know, and they get free hangers. Wonderful. Everybody's happy win-win situation. So that's what we did. We bagged them up. We put them outside with a little sign saying, free hangers, help yourself. And guess what? Hardly anybody took them. So then I had another thought because I was learning psychology at the time. And I had understood this concept that anything that's free has got no value. But everybody likes a Mitsia, don't they? Everybody likes a bargain. So we bagged them up again and we put a sign out, hangers, 10p a bag, right? 10p, which was not very much even then. They went like wildfire. We sold a lot of them. We didn't have any hangers left from upstairs. It was marvellous, cleared the lot out. So for free, they wouldn't have them. But for 10p, it was a bargain, they'd have them. Uh, and that was a, a very, very good experiment that proves that something that is free at the point of delivery has no value in the eye of the, um, of the receiver. By the way, that is one of the problems with the National Health Service in the UK, that it is free at the point of delivery, and therefore it is not valued as it should be. People don't turn up for their appointments. Uh, people waste their, their drugs. Uh, they pick up their medication and don't bother taking it and then pick up another lot. And eventually they throw it all away because they don't pay for it at the point of delivery. You'll tell me they're paying for it in their taxes and everything. Well, of course they are. But at the point of delivery, it's free and it has little value. And over the years of the NHS, uh, on numerous occasions, it has been suggested by various think tanks that there should be a small charge. That's when prescription charges came in. You're all old enough to remember a time when there were no prescription charges. Uh, it came in uh, shortly after I started practice, so it must have been in the 80s. It came in, and I remember it was 20p for a prescription. I think it's about 10 quid now. Um, it's, it was 20p for a prescription, um, and there was uproar. There was absolute uproar when that was brought in. Uh, but the reason it was brought in was not for the 20p, because it actually cost more to collect the 20p than the 20p. It was brought in as an idea that something that is free at the point of delivery has less value. It was in, in, in order to give it more value. So there have been various suggestions over the, 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 the generations of the NHS to charge a fiver for a GP's appointment. Um, not that that is worth a fiver, it might not even be worth that, but um, it's so that um, it's not free at the point of delivery and therefore um, it has some value. So. Um, this is this is well, the, the, on the, your theorem of free, Johnny. And we appreciate them very much. Oh well, that's that's good. Thank you very much, Johnny. Thank you very much. But what if I charge ten p entrance? We'd have we'd have yeah. queues. We'd have queues yeah. of people coming definitely, in. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So so um, so yeah, Moshe Moshe here is 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 really miffed with these people 
because he sees, number one, he sees them as ungrateful, as Jeffrey said. And number two, the particular complaint was unjustified because it was a, a primal sort of material desire for meat. It's almost like an animal desire for meat. You know, they want to rip apart a piece of flesh with, you know, with, with lots of oozing blood out of it and a nice rare steak with, uh, you know, I don't have to describe it to you. So there, Moshe sees that as very low in spirituality. This desire for meat is a low spiritual level and he's very unhappy with it. And that's why this particular um, sin was what got his goat. And the place becomes known as, um, I think probably the, the end of this chapter, or the beginning of the next chapter, um, it's called, uh, let's just have a look. Here we go. Verse 34, Jeffrey. You name that place uh, Kivrat Tatava. Graves of craving, for they buried the people who craved. There they buried the people. Yeah. So what happened was these people, um, they, uh, um, Akadosh Baruch Hu was un angry with them uh, because of this. He gave them these quails. They ate these quails. They gathered them up. Have a look at verse 32. People rose up all that day and all night and the next day and gathered the quails. Even the one who gathered the least collected 10 heaps. They spread them around the camp in piles. Carry on. The meat was still between their teeth. It was not yet finished. And the anger of the Lord flared against the people. And the Lord struck the people with a very mighty blow. So what happened was, it's a bit unfair, really, uh, if you look at it superficially. They asked for meat. God says, all right, I'll give you meat. He gives them all this quail. They go around collecting it. And how do they go around collecting it? This is where, where they, they, they made their mistake. Instead of saying, oh, that's very nice. I'll just have a little couple of quail here for my, for my supper here. I'll, I'll, I'll roast it. I'll boil it. I'll do it. What they did was they went around like, like lunatics, collecting these quail like they've never seen food in their life. You know what it's like? You go to a, a kiddush in a Shabbos morning uh, and people, it looks like they've never eaten. They like swarm on it, okay? Why? Why? The opposite of what I just said before, because it's free, right? So here's this quail, and the one that gathered the least gathered ten piles of it. What do you need ten piles of quail for? You're in the desert. What do you think is going to happen to you if you eat quail that you've stored up in the desert without refrigeration? What's going to happen to you? Okay. You're going to get deli belly, aren't you? <laughs> You're going to be ill. You're going to get ill. And that's what happened. Kodesh Baruch Hu sent them a very mighty blow, and they, a lot of them died. And that's why, the verse 34, Jeffrey, again, please. He named that place Kibrot Ha-Ta'ava, graves of craving, for they buried the people who craved. So those place, that, that place became known as Kivrot HaTa'ava. Ta'ava means desire, means craving. So those people who craved the meat, that was their burial place. They died there. So it became known as Kivrot HaTa'ava. That was the place that this uh, happened. And um, so that was the story that prompted um, this. Uh, let's go back to verse 16 on the screen for you, Jeffrey. Then the Lord said to Moses, assemble for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the people's elders and officers, and you shall take them to the tent of meeting, and they shall stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there, and I will increase the spirit that is upon you and bestow it upon them. Then they will bear the burden of the people with you so that you need not bear it alone. OK, stop there. So those were the two psukin that we did last week, which and if you remember, it was this word itach, uh, with you, 
um, that we ended up using to prove that Moshe was with the 70 elders and it was 70 plus Moshe. Remember, that was what we did last week. So then I asked you the question. Well, God says, assemble for me 70 men of the elders of Israel. How did he choose them? So let's now find out from the Gemara how he chose them. OK, we're over here. You can see the, the screen. Yeah, it's, the Gemara is on, back on the screen. Good. Tanu Rabbanan. Um, the rabbis learned. Vayisharu shnei anashim bamachane. The verse says there were two men who remained in the camp. What are we talking about? Anybody know what we're talking about? Say that again, Michael, you're muted. You're still muted. Eldad and Maydad. Eldad and Maydad, correct. Would you like to tell us the story of Eldad and Maydad? Well, they, they got prophecy, but for some reason they decided not to go with the rest. Okay. They got prophecy and they decided not to go with the rest. Good. And? And. <laughs> I can't remember any more than that, I'm afraid. What's that got to do with our story here of how Moshe chose his 70 elders? Well, they were chosen, evidently. They were but they chosen must have been number 71 and 72. Okay. Very good. Very good, Michael. Excellent. That is spot on. We'll go and look at the story of Eldad and Maydad now. Jeffrey, did you want to say something? Well, I was going to say um, they, they were the two left over because there was only 70 needed. OK, so two left over from what? From Well, they because th th there was... Um, if you like, 72 candidates, and only 70 of them were needed. Okay, so, how, do you, how do you know there were 72 candidates? Um, well, there must have been, if they, if they were given the, um, uh, uh, the prophecy. Okay, so you're working backwards. Okay, very good, both of you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Because both of what, what both of you have just said is the basis of the Gemara that we're going to learn now. Um, so either um, you are incredibly clever or you've learned this Gemara before in a previous life <laughs> or you've read on one of those three, one of those three. Not right. not let's, not have a look. let's have a look at what we're talking about. Let's go to the story of Eldad and Medad, which is in our same chapter. So um, what happens is this. Um, Six. Verse 24, Jeffrey. Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said, and he assembled 70 men of the elders of the people and stood them around the tent. The Lord descended in the cloud and spoke to him, and he increased them of the spirit that was on him and bestowed it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not continue. Now, two men remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the second was Medad, and the spirit rested upon them. They were among those written, but they did not go out to the tent, but prophesied in the camp. The lamp ran and told Moses, saying, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. OK, stop there. Now, there's lots in there that we need to talk about. So... Let's go and look at it carefully. Let's unpack it. The Lord descended in a cloud and spoke to him and increased him in the spirit that was on him. That's Moshe and bestowed it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not continue. OK, just park that bit because Michael's got a very quizzical look on his face and you're right to have a quizzical look on his face. What is that talking about? The Gemara is going to explain that to us, what it means in a bit. But it, you're right to have a quizzical look because it doesn't really make sense. Now, two men remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the name of the second was Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. Now, that indicates what? They had the prophecy. 
So they were part of the 70, right? Well, no, I think there were addition to it. But but that's not what it says. Moshe uh, assembled 70 men and the Lord descended and bestowed it on the 70 elders. It doesn't say he bestowed it on 72 elders. That's true. So I read that. I read that as that he, they were part of the 70 because the spirit rested on them. OK, so far, are you with me so far? Yeah. Now, look at this interesting expression. What does this mean? I'm over here in the Hebrew. Vehema baketuvim. They were among those written. Written for what? Written where? What was written? Where was it written? And why was it written? What are we talking about here? What is this puzzle talking about? They were among those written but they did not go out to the tent. So did they get a guilt-edged invitation? Dear 70 elders, or dear Eldad and Medad, please present yourself at the Ohel Moed to have the spirit of God bestowed upon you. Is that what they're talking about? Or did they get a written invitation? What is that talking about, that Ketuvim? Any ideas? Was it they were among 70 given the prophecy. But why did it say they were amongst those written? Should have said they were amongst those given the prophecy. Was there a ballot and they picked... They... Oh, a ballot. Okay, Johnny's also learned this Gemara in a previous existence. All oh, read on. All oh, read on, <laughs> yeah. Okay, there was a ballot. Okay, very good. Right, now we so we can start to answer these questions. The Gemara uh, is much more observant than us and noticed all these peculiarities. Um, and has helped us to understand it. Let's go back to it. There we are. So, the Pasuk says, they, these two men, Eldad and Medad, remained in the camp. Yesh Omrim, there are some who explain this to mean, Bekalpi Nishtairu. What is a Kalpi? I'm just doing a shear. I'll call you back. Um, what is a calpi? In a ballot box. It is a ballot box. How did you know that, Johnny? Well, because I mentioned about a ballot. It is a ballot box. And the reason we should all know that is because we have been sent yeah. to the ballot box ad nauseam in the last few years, have we not? Five elections in, in yeah. however many years, right? And the thing that you put your vote into, a uh, ballot box in English, is called in modern Hebrew, the Kalpi. Exactly the same word, Kalpi. So the Gemara says these two, when it says they remained in the camp, their ballots remained in the box. Now, how do you understand that? They weren't picked. That's how I would understand it as well. Funnily enough, one of the explanations in the Gemara is not that. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at what the Gemara says. Sheba At the time, Sha'a, time, yeah? At the time that HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Moshe, Esfa li shivim ish mizikne Yisrael. When Hashem said to Moshe, gather to me, 70 elders from, uh, 70 men from the elders of Israel. Amar Moshe, Moshe said, Ketzad e how shall I do it? He scratches his head, says, I'm not how to do this. Evro shisha mikol shevet for shevet. If I choose, if I choose evror, but livror means to choose, um, if I choose six from each tribe, Nimtsu, it will work out that there will be Shnaim Yeterim. There'll be two over. Six times 12 is? 72. 72. There'll be two over. 
Evro chamisha chamisha mikol shevet for shevet. But if I if I choose five from every tribe, nimtzu asara chaserim. Five times twelve is sixty. There'll be ten missing. I'll be short of ten. So what shall I do? Evro shisha mishevet ze the chamisha mishevet ze. If I choose six from some tribes and five from other tribes, what will that do? Broigus. Broigus. Hareni matil kinah benashvatim. I will bring about jealousy. Kinah, jealousy between the tribes. We can't have that. There'll be a broigus. Will everybody start fighting? So, me'asa. What did he do? Beirer shisha shisha. He um, he chose six from each tribe. So you've got seventy-two elders. Vehevi shivim ushnaim pitakin. What is a petek in modern Hebrew and in Yiddish actually as well? A petek is a little piece of paper. What you put in the wall at the cartel. It say. is. It's what you put in the wall at the cartel. Yeah. Uh, if you you have grandchildren who are in uh, Gan, and they do something very very nice for you, they do a big mitzvah. I don't know. They go and get your slippers from your bedroom or something. Make you a cup of coffee. You might want to give them, or they might ask you for a petek nachat. A petek nachat, piece of paper of nachat. What's nachat? Nachas. Nachas. Okay. Petek okay. nachat is a little piece of paper that you write on. Little Yankala did a wonderful thing today. He made me a cup of coffee or he said Shema beautifully. And you give it to him and he gives it to his teacher in school. And that is called a petek nachat. And sometimes they get them from the teacher and they give it back to your parents and you get a petek nachat. I didn't get many of them from my kids in school, by the way. I didn't get many pitke nachat. Um, they were a bit mean with them in Jewish day school, certainly in my children's case anyway. Right. So a petek is a little piece of paper. When you go and vote in the local elections on the um, 31st of October and you are... Uh, given all your different choices, each one of those choices is a petek. And you, of course, will choose the petek that says Miriam Feierberg Ikar for mayor and Natanya Achat for the party. That's what you will, that's the petek that you will choose to put in your envelope um, and put it then into the Kalpi. Okay, that is a petek. So you're telling us who to vote for. I couldn't possibly. Well, I can do that since I'm not in shul. Yes, I'm allowed to do it. I'm not allowed to do it in shul and I'm not allowed to use my position as the president of the shul um, uh, to uh, campaign. But since the, I am giving this shield in a private capacity, yes, I'm okay. telling you who to vote for, Johnny. <laughs> Especially since I am a candidate. Right. So can I just go for a side for a second. Why wouldn't Hashem therefore have said, look, let's have... Uh, 72 plus one rather than 70 so just to make it even so as not to have this problem good question good question why didn't he say 60 or 60 or 460 for that matter yeah yeah or 12 or any other um denominator any other factor of 12 good question don't know it's one of the questions you'll have to ask a kodesh Baruch Hu after 120 michael write it down <laughs> in your list of questions um uh, I'm tempted to say, because if he did, we wouldn't have this Gemara. Um, but that, yes. that would not be a great answer. Uh, I don't know. Fair question. Um, but I don't think you're allowed to ask questions. Why did Hashem do this or not do that? I think that's probably a question that's out of bounds. So in any event... Did, did Moshe work this out for himself what to do? Or did God tell him how to No, do? no, it, it seems that he worked it out for himself. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. vi shivim ushnaim pitakin. He brought 72 petakim, 72 peteks. And what did he do? 
Al Shivim, on 70 of them, Katav, he wrote the word Zaken, elder. Ushnayim, and two of them, Hiniach Chalak. He, uh, he, Hiniach, he placed Chalak. What's Chalak mean? Blank. Well, it does mean blank, yes, because you knew that from the context. But what does the word mean? Chalak doesn't mean blank. Rake means empty. What does chalak mean? If you go, if you go, this is a very obtuse now. If you go to the butchers, um, okay, it, it's um, it's uh, it's a shame Avril's um, uh, disappeared because she was known. Huh? Is that portion? That's chalak. Yeah, same same root. Yeah. Uh, same letters. If you're going to the butcher, and the reason I said that Avril will know this is because Avril has kids who are uh, Haredi, um, and they will only eat a certain type of meat with a certain type of hechsha, which we would call... Badats. We would call what? Badats. Badats is a, is a hechsha from the... Badats stands for Beit Din Tzedek. Uh, they were... But what's a type of meat that they might only eat? It begins, with a, G, it begins with a G. Glatt. Glatt. Oh, they will only eat glatt meat. Now, if you go in the butcher here, and you go, if you go to a, an Ashkenazi butcher, and you say you want glatt meat, he will know what you mean. But if you go to a Sephardi butcher, who has not had anything to do with Ashkenazim, and you ask for glatt meat, you won't know what you're talking about. What is the Hebrew word for glatt? Well, I'll give you a clue. It's the word we're talking about. Chalak. Okay. So if you want to go and, and speak Hebrew and you want glatt meat, you go into your butcher and you ask for chalak. And the word chalak and the word glatt Glatt does not mean very or highly. Glatt kosher doesn't mean highly kosher or very kosher or more kosher. The word glatt, which is the same word as chalak, means smooth, smooth. Where do you know that word from in the Torah? Smooth. Where do you know that from? I'll give you a clue. It's in Bereshit. Um, yes, that's arms. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's arms. Yes, very good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. 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 It is at the end of Pasha Tolgot, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Um, so here we go. Um, Rifka says to um, says to Jacob, go and Get the brochas off your father, uh, because he, um, here we go. Um, it is in Bereshit chapter 27. I'll get it on the screen for you. Why not? Uh, Bereshit. Aesop's hair. Farmers were hairy. Yeah. A Bereshit chapter 27. And it is verse 12. Um, go on 11. Verse 11, Jeffrey. On the screen. And Jacob said to Rebecca, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, whereas I am a smooth man. Stop there. Um, Stop there. Esav, Achi, Ish, Sa'ir. Esav, my brother, is a hairy man. Va'anochi, and I, Ish, Chalak. I am a smooth man. Okay, there it is. So, Chalak means smooth. Now, uh, what's that got to do with glatt meat? What's that got to do with meat? Why is glatt, the word glatt, by the way, means smooth? What's that got to do with kashrut? Anyone know? I think because uh, I think it has to have all the veins pulled out. Um, otherwise, it's not smooth. 
Okay, you're on the right, you're on the right lines, but not quite. You're on the right lines that in order for something to be glatt kosher, uh, it has to undergo certain processes or at least certain checks. And it refers, okay. it referred not porging, no, that's talking about the rump uh, area. It's talking about the lungs, okay? Glatt, glatt meat is from an animal which has had its lungs checked for nodules. One of the blemishes that makes that can make an animal not kosher is if there are blemishes, nodules on the lungs. OK, now um, most animals do not have nodules on their lungs and um, it is assumed for there's a certain check that does not have to be done for an animal to be kosher because it's assumed that had it been done, the animal will be okay because the majority of animals are okay. Are you with me? That is your regular kosher meat. Glatt meat has had that check done. Somebody sticks their hands into the lungs and puts their hands all over it and feels the lungs and checks the lungs to make sure that it doesn't have any nodules on it, to make sure that it is. Smooth. Smooth. Halak. Glatt. So glatt meat comes from a uh, animal that has had its lungs extra checked for smoothness. OK, so that is why you cannot have glatt kosher dairy restaurant. Makes no sense. The use of the word is incorrect. Because glatt means smooth and it means that the lungs are checked. Well, the last time I looked, cheeses didn't have any lungs to check. So you cannot have a glatt kosher milky restaurant. If you see a glatt kosher milky restaurant, then you have to suspect that the person who's put that sign up don't know what they're talking about. OK, we know what it means, but it doesn't make any sense. So chalak means smooth. OK. It means smooth, and in the uh, in the meat situation, it means smooth lungs. Lungs have been checked for smoothness. So now you know what glatt meat is. Why is glatt meat more expensive? For two reasons. Number one, somebody has to do the check. Okay, so there's a, there's a labor cost, and that person has to be trained how to do it, etc. So there's a, a, a training cost. And secondly, what are you going to do with the animals that you find have got a nodule on it. You can't, can't use then, you can't use them for regular cash rut because they've got a nodule on them. The regular cash rut ones, we don't know whether they've got nodules on, you just don't check it, okay? But the ones that you find that have got nodules when you're checking for GLAT, they have to go to the trafe market. So that obviously lowers the percentage of animals that can go to the kosher market. And that's why glatt meat is more expensive because there's more wastage and there's a labor cost in actually doing the check. So that's um, nothing to do with our Gemara, but it's to do with the word chalak. So when you said, when you told me, Michael, that Moshe left these two um, petakin, these two peteks blank, um, you were right. And you got that from the context. Ushnaim hiniach chalak. He left them smooth. Okay. Now, bearing in mind, these would have been uh, not pieces of paper and a pen. They probably would have been um, shards of uh, of, of uh, earthenware, uh, which, which were, you know, uh, written on, engraved in, you know, with uh, that's how you would do it, wouldn't you, in those days? You read the uh, Rabbi Stan's house on the top right, where it says language. It tells you. Pitaki or an animal. I mean a kind of board, a piece of paper, or an animal skin that could be written on. Right. So this was probably some kind of uh, skin. And how would you write on it? You indent on it, don't you? You right. And if you haven't written on it, it remains smooth. Smooth. And that's why it says um, he left it smooth. Okay. Um, blank. We would say blank because. Um, our piece of paper uh, would still be smooth even if you've got writing on it, but not 
if you looked at it microscopically, you would still be, you would see it would be raised even with ink. So um, he looked, he's got seventy two um, ballots in a box. Seventy of them have got written Zakane Elder and two are blank. And of course, what happened then was Balalan. Balalan. What does that mean? What does it mean to read somebody a bilble? Jeffrey, a bit of Yiddish for you. You'd have heard Grant say that as well. You're, but you, 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 you're muted. Tell them a tale. Yeah, you a mixed up holding a whole load of nonsense, right? So balal means he mixed it up. Balalan, he got this box and he mixed it all up. Unatanan bakalpe, and he put them in to the ballot box. Amalahem, he said to them, to the 70 elders, or no, sorry, to the 72 elders that he's chosen, he says, come and take your petek. So the 72 pieces of whatever paper we'll call them, for want of a better word, in a box, 70 of them have got written on them elder, two of them are blank, and he says to all 72, Come and pick one out. Call me Sha'alabi Yadozake. Anybody who pulled one out that said elder, Ama, Moshe said, Kvar Kideshcha Shamaim. Heaven has sanctified you already. In other words, you've been chosen by heaven. Umi Sha'alabi Yado Chalak. But the Nebuch that pulls out a blank one, what does he say to him? Amar, he said, Hamakom. Lo chafetz b'cha. God does not want you. Ani ma e'eselecha. What can I do for you? Sorry, mate. Shem don't want you. So that was the plan. Okay? That was the plan that Moshe hatched in order to choose the 70 elders. The only problem is Eldad and Maydad decided not to play ball. And he mucked, they mucked up the system. Let's go on. Kayotse, Kayotse, Badavar. Oh, okay, wait a minute. We're going to, we're going to digress now. Another, another, uh, we're going to stop here, by the way, because it's quarter past. The Gemara now is going off at a tangent and it's going to tell us in parentheses another time when Moshe Rabbeinu used this lottery system, okay? Uh, and then we're going to come back to Eldad and Medad. Um, so what we've learned today is that uh, Hashem said, appoint 70 elders. Moshe didn't know how to do it, didn't want to cause broigus between the tribes. So he said, right, well, we'll have 72 and we'll draw lots. And we'll have 70 pieces of paper with elder written on it. Two of them are blank. And we'll all 72 of you will come along and pick it out. And the two that get a blank, well, you're the ones that God doesn't want to be an elder. And off you go. So that was uh, where we go. We're going to do this next bit next week about another story of um, uh, lottery. And then we'll come back probably the week after to see how Eldad and Maydad mucked up Moshe's little uh, plan for appointing the elders. They completely messed it up by their behavior. And we will learn at the same time a very, very famous piece of Gemara, the content of which you will all know, but you didn't know it came from here. Um, and that is probably in two weeks' time. So if you don't want to know what it is, don't read on. Um, okay, any questions on what oh. we've done? Today. Yeah, with this Eldad and Maydad, is that despite being not chosen, God had chosen to give them prophecy anyway. So he, ah. he chose to give all 72 prophecy. Oh, or maybe, maybe, or maybe not. You'll have to wait and find out, Michael. <laughs> You'll have to wait and find out whether you are correct. That is a possibility. It is a possibility. But there are other possibilities that the Gomorrah will put forward. Um, uh, and you will see that in a couple of weeks' time, please, God. Any other questions?
Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, have a good week. Um, tonight, if you're interested, uh, and let me just stop the recording, you don't need to, the whole world doesn't need to know this.